Dear Professor Gilmeyer Bucher, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview. We are very happy here at the Scholars Corner that you present to us today some of your insights in your project, in your current project. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this interview. I'm glad to be able to talk a little bit about my research project. It's our pleasure. Besides your research fields in the Book of Judges or in the field of anthropology, your main topic is the Bible and its reception, especially in arts and literature. Already around 2000 you participated at a college in Tübingen uh, investigating forms of reception. And since 2013 uh, you work on a project founded by the Austrian Science Foundation that focuses on the image or maybe the images of King Solomon. Before talking about this multifaceted project, I would like to start with some uh, previous stations in your academic career that uh, lead you to this issue. Uh, so maybe you can highlight some turning points in your academic biography or some certain persons that influenced you and that led you to this interest in reception history. Mm -hmm. Well, I have become interested in reception quite early in my biblical studies. Uh, when I work, worked on my PhD thesis, I soon realized that the reader does not become as much attention as other aspects of the text. Even uh, with semantic and neurological approaches, uh, the reader was just on the side. Mm -hmm. And so I my interest was kindled and I started to look for the readers and I came to read the response theories and I explored this field further and then I engaged with intertextuality mm -hmm. and the theories uh, established by Bachtin and yes. Julia Kristeva yes. and I was quite fascinated by this whole universe of texts and this great network of texts where no text is a closed entity but always in relation and in dialogue mm -hmm. with other texts. And so I tried to apply these concepts to the biblical texts. And at the time I have been encouraged by my colleagues, former teachers and later colleagues, uh, Professor Josef Oesch or Professor Wolfgang Wiesmüller from German Literature and Language Institute and they encouraged me to look beyond biblical texts, not only relations within biblical texts or between biblical texts and other ancient Near Eastern texts, mm -hmm. but also relations between the Bible and literature, mm -hmm. modern literature in particular. And that's, I think that's why I choose the topic for my habilitation to work on yeah. Thomas Bernhard, a quite famous Austrian poet from the 20th century, and compare some of his poems with the biblical psalms mm -hmm. and to see how these relations work between modern poems and biblical texts. And as you already mentioned, mm -hmm. during this work on my habilitation, I had the opportunity to spend two years in Tübingen to engage in research projects there and to, and especially to learn from scholars I met there. And well, that's that's all about my starting uh, on this field. And since this time, I always returned to questions of reception history. Mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated by uh, all the interpreters and exegetes and literary works uh, which through, throughout centuries tried to explore, to interpret and to work with mm -hmm. biblical texts. Mm -hmm. um, I already mentioned it and it's all about the funded project ruler, lover, sage and septic receptions of King Solomon. First of all, in general, what is your project all about? What are you, the issues, the questions uh, that you are trying to research? Well, uh, the first and main goal of this project is to find and collect works of literature and music from the 16th to the 21st century. And it's mostly German literature mm -hmm. and music performed in German-speaking countries. Uh, the idea was born 
probably eight years ago, uh, when Elisabeth Birnbaum from the University of Vienna and I decided to work on a research project together. And then it was Elizabeth's idea to choose King Solomon. And we soon discovered that this figure is really worthwhile doing a project on because although it's a very famous biblical king, almost everybody knows King Solomon, and there is a huge reception history, uh, there are not many studies focusing, okay. focusing on Solomon, uh, quite contrary um, to David. There are is a lot of work that uh -huh. has been done on David, but almost nothing on Solomon. Mm. So we, we started to look for works uh, dealing with King Solomon. And what we want to do is we want to explore how the story that is told in the first book of Kings unfolds throughout centuries. And this process already begins in the biblical texts themselves. We have stories of Solomon not only in the first book of Kings, but also in the sec uh, first and second book of Chronicles. Uh, we see King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, yeah. we see it in the book of Proverbs, mm -hmm. we have the wisdom of Solomon, and even once the biblical texts have been finished and, if you want to, uh, they have been closed, the reception goes on in the religious communities, Christian, Jewish and Islamic traditions, mm -hmm. and we see a lot of legends developing uh, around this figure of Solomon, and so this figure becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and gets even more character traits. It becomes a really rich and ambivalent king. Yeah. And while we as biblical scholars are trained and used to clearly distinguish between the different sources, the different books and the different images presented of King Solomon in these various sources, for artists it all is one. It's mm -hmm. a huge reservoir okay. of different character traits, of different stories, different images of just one king. How can we imagine your working process? Maybe you could give us some more details about this. Who is in your team? What sub-projects uh, are you working on? Are there special corporations? Maybe you could mm -hmm. give us some more details in this. Well, we are quite a small team of four people. Uh, we have one specialist of uh, German literature, it's um, Dr. Imelda Robacher. We have a PhD student, Antonia mm -hmm. Kreiner, and we also have a master student who studies theology and musicology. It's mm -hmm. Elena Deinam. So we have different um, disciplines in our project. One of our main goals, as I already mentioned, is to provide a collection of literary works. So we are building a database. Mm -hmm. And in this database, we not only include bibliographical information on all the works we can find, we also add further information. So, for example, we add a short summary of the contents. Uh, we also make a list of biblical figures appearing in the book. So you can tell, well, in this book we have, for example, King Solomon, and we have his oh, mother okay. Bathsheba, and we have maybe the Queen of uh, mm -hmm. Sheba, etc. Uh, we also add keywords pointing to Solomon's characteristics. So we um, make a note if Solomon is especially wise or he, if he's portrayed as a magician mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And we also note if extra-biblical uh, literature is used in these literary works. So if there are legends in these works. So, mm -hmm. so that other researchers might get some idea what these works about. Uh, and of course, this database is also searchable, so you can look for specific uh, works uh, you might be interested mm -hmm. in. So in this way, we try to develop a tool that will be hopefully helpful for mm -hmm. other scholars who want to work on King Solomon. And once this database is finished, it will be, of course, available for free mm -hmm. on the Internet. Okay. As you have already published and presented many results from your research, may you present to us some of the central theses. I suppose that there have been some astonishing and uh, surprising revealings about King Solomon regarding the broad materi material that you are looking uh, at. So, in your opinion, what are the most interesting or surprising insights 
in King Solomon's reception? Well, as, as you say, there have been a lot of findings that I think are quite interesting and quite astonishing. And we also have been able to find some quite remarkable books and manuscripts. And I think one of the most uh, impressive ones was a manuscript from the library in Zittau in Germany from a Baroque drama by a quite famous Baroque author. It's uh, Christian Weise and the Commedia vom König Salomo. And what's so uh, interesting here, although this is a quite famous Baroque author, this work on Solomon has never been published before. Okay. And so I'm really happy that Dr. Imelda Rohrbacher uh, was able to right. find these manuscripts, to edit them, and now to publish them. Well, this might be one of our most uh, interesting findings. However, many other works would also be worth the effort to have a closer and deeper look at them. Uh, of course, we are only a small team. We cannot do all this research ourselves. And that's why we always try to invite other colleagues and also colleagues from other disciplines, so from literary studies, from musicology, from history, to help us. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do for our final publication of this project. So we try to um, invite as many scholars as possible to add their perspective to work on selected books and, and pieces of music. And on the other hand, we will also give an overview over, over this, this whole material. Okay. So we are trying to point out some very popular themes we find in reception mm -hmm. of King Solomon. Uh, and we are using this concept Brennan Breed calls semantic notes. Okay. So you can see throughout the centuries there are some notes um, many authors or musicians use and get interested in. And for King Solomon, these are especially um, images of King Solomon as a ruler, mm -hmm. images of, of the king as a wise man, but also images of King Solomon as a lover mm -hmm. and as a womanist. Okay. So it's quite interesting what, what all these authors saw in, in these different characteristics of Solomon. So for example, in the king, it, it, it might be no surprise that up to the 17th century, King Solomon always was an exemplary, good and wise mm -hmm. king. Mm -hmm. And he just was a role model for kings and princes. But later on, he has been viewed much more critically. Okay. And so he also became the king who was not able to hold on to his kingdom, or he even became a role model for dictators. Okay. So you, some of the artists, uh, especially modern authors, were then able to criticize the political system they themselves were living in through the lens of the biblical mm -hmm. text. This is an interesting aspect. Um, I wonder what is about Solomon and his uh, relationship to God. Did you have there any interesting insights and examples? Oh, oh yes, of course. It's always an um, important topic, um, the relationship of Solomon mm -hmm. to, to, to his God. And especially in modern times, um, this relationship becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. Or uh, let's say it's not the same as in uh, former times. So Solomon becomes a modern ruler, a modern monarch, and he is not only the pious king, but he's also the self-critical king, uh, the wise man who has doubts, has also doubts about his own religion. And I think one of the most interesting examples, for me at least, was that when a biblical story tells that Solomon at the end in chapter 10 and 11 it is told mm -hmm. that he has a lot of wives and these wives turn his heart towards other deities and he even builds sanctuaries for other deities. And the biblical narrator clearly rejects this building uh, sanctuaries mm -hmm. for other gods. But in modern literature, sometimes, especially historic novels or also light fictions, uh, they make a positive trade out of that mm -hmm. because they argue, well, you can see Solomon has been a quite modern uh, monarch because he's so liberal. Mm -hmm. His religious okay. uh, attitude is so liberal, he even supports all the other cults and religion in uh -huh. his country. And so they make it possible that he still is uh, a role model, but now for modern 
politicians or modern rulers who have, of course, to be open for more than one religion mm -hmm. in their countries. Uh, okay. I see. Currently, you are also working on the volume for the Illumination Commentary series. This commentary focuses, amongst others, on the history of consequences as a special rubric. Could you explain to us what is uh, the special rubric history of consequences in the context of uh, reception history? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it really is a unique feature of this commentary series to focus on the consequences of biblical mm -hmm. texts. And as Leong Xiao, the main editor of yes. this series, defines it, consequences is everything that comes after the biblical texts. So it's interpretations, it is receptions, but it's also the consequences these receptions had. So it's okay. even much broader than my own Solomon mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. It includes everything. It includes theolo theological explanations, exegesis, homilies, but also mm -hmm. arts, film, music, but also whatever came from this. It even if politicians use biblical texts and even if the interpretations have consequences, be they good or bad, mm -hmm. it is an issue for this commentary. And what I think it, it's really fascinating it is that this um, series encourages us as contributors to start with the consequences. So okay. it's, it's, it's really consequent in a sense that we are aware that all oh, what we do today, we can only do on the basis of all that has been done before mm. us. So we are encouraged to look at the whole tradition of interpretations and then to decide what we want to do with this text. Of course, this is a very ambitious project mm -hmm. and uh, we do not have the space in this, um, in this books to present everything we find so it only can be a selection, but it should be a well-researched and representative selection. So I think that it's really a, a new commentary in this way. So and we become very aware that we as researchers never are a tabula rasa, mm -hmm. that we cannot go back to the origins mm -hmm. and say, well, we are not influenced by these 2000 years or more of interpretation history. And this project also points out that the texts do not only have an original meaning, but that okay. these texts always are the sum of all the meanings mm -hmm. they have been ascribed to. In your expertise, what would you say are the chances and benefits of the approach of a reception history and maybe also what are the limitations of this method? I mean, you have searched in this field for so many years. What are the challenges to overcome uh, investigation, receptions from then until now? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of benefits, but also there are challenges, of course. I think that in, re, engaging with reception history really is a mind-opening uh, enterprise. Mm -hmm. It's always inspiring to see what people saw in these texts, how they understood them, and how they implore the potentials of the texts. So it really adds to our own interpretations. And I have learned time and again uh, that there are still more ways to look at the texts and to see aspects in the texts mm -hmm. I haven't been uh, aware before. And I think another quite fascinating aspect is that when we see how those older interpretations have been influenced by their own time, by their own context, mm -hmm. we also become aware how much we ourselves are influenced mm -hmm. by, this, by our context. Although I think we, at least theoretically, are aware of these influences, it's good to see it time and again. And it really helps us to think about our own context and our own limitations mm -hmm. and our own interests in these texts. And of course we also see that we cannot agree with all the interpretations. Mm -hmm. uh, some interpretations are very inspiring but also interpretations also are a warning, especially if we look at the 
anti-Semitic or misogynistic mm. racist mm. interpretations we, we can find. And so it also points us to the possibility that our interpretations have consequences. So it's on the one hand, it's exploring the full potential what these texts might mean and what these texts might mean in different contexts. I think that's a great chance we have when we engage with research uh, research in um, reception history and on the other hand also to be warned uh, yes. not to go uh, specific ways. Mm, well, what about limitations? I think the greatest challenge is the huge abundance of material. Oh. So it, we have not only many, many works, uh, works of art, but also a very long tradition of interpretation in mm -hmm. different uh, religious communities. Um, we also have different approaches. So we can look at these texts from a historical perspective, from a literary perspective, from all perspective of arts, from a theological perspective. Uh, and so it's no surprise that this kind of research is often suspected to be on the verge of amateurism and dilettantism. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, well, it's a chance we have to take. And of course, it's, for me at least, it's also a motivation to um, get in contact with other scholars from mm -hmm. other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So it motivates us to, to work together, to f find collaborations, work on projects together and see what others have to say to the same text mm -hmm. and to compare our interests mm -hmm. and also our question on these texts. So I think these are the challenges, but there's a huge reward if you really engage with this kind of research. And you already started uh, these collaborations um, with an international crew of co-editors. You founded 2017 mm -hmm. the online journal Bible in the Arts. And there the first volume was about uh, King Solomon and showed this surprisingly broad variety of uh, material. So maybe you can tell us something about this journal, how this mm -hmm. idea uh, came up and what it's all about. Well, actually, the idea to launch an online journal on Bible and the arts came up during a symposium uh, on the topic of King Solomon we had in Linz. We, uh, to broaden our horizon, we had invited different scholars from uh, literature, from musicology, from, from history, uh, from other theological studies, and asked him to present a paper and give us their expertise on Solomon. Mm -hmm. And we had a lovely discussions, we heard excellent papers, and when we talked about publishing these papers, we thought it would be great to have uh, this publication easily available mm -hmm. and available for free and for all disciplines alike and not a mostly specific series of biblical yes. studies, so n nobody in literature would look into these books. And well, when everybody agreed to to offer their papers for such a new journal, for such an experiment, Klaus Koenen from the University of Cologne and I started this project. So King Solomon is, is our godfather mm -hmm. of this journal. And that's also why the first volume focuses on one yes. biblical figure. And from there, from there on, we tried to motivate other colleagues to send us pieces of their work on Bible and the arts. And so far we have really interesting papers. Yeah. We have a wide variety of papers. And I think it's, and I hope it's a growing field and we can have this journal for many more years. Uh, yeah, that would uh, lead to my last question, Professor Gelmeier Bucher. Encouraging the scientific exchange you already mentioned it. What do you hope and what do you expect for the future academic discourse regarding mm -hmm. your project or regarding the topic of uh, uh, reception history? What are your hopes or where do you think there could be uh, some projects in the future, some ideas and mm -hmm. important collaborations? Well, I expect that the interest in the field of the reception history will grow. It is 
already growing and expanding and a lot of exemplary studies and overviews are being published. Mm. So I think it becomes easier to um, jump into this field and to start and to make uh, one's own contribution. And what I really hope for is that more and more colleagues from other disciplines mm. will get interested and that we will be able to find the colleagues already interested because there are a lot of people from literature or from, from music, from the arts who also work with these biblical topics and that we will be able to connect to form relations and, and joint projects. And I'm quite optimistic that mm. that will happen during the next years. And that's why we also founded this journal. And it's one mm -hmm. of our, our main goals is to, to build these rela relations, to establish these connections mm -hmm. and to offer a platform to publish these mm -hmm. articles. And what we want to achieve is really uh, high quality research articles. So we want other scholars to find such articles mm -hmm. in our journals. We want also to um, have a platform where people can look for other colleagues who are yes. also interested Very in the important. field. So you go to our journal and you see, well, which people are interested, which people have, have published there, and you can easily uh, have contact with them. And of course, we also want to provide a platform for anybody who works on whatever topic, Bible and the arts, and arts in a very broad sense, mm -hmm. and encourage them and invite them to send us a paper, send us a, a manuscript, and to enrich and engage in the discussions we want to foster in this channel. Mm, great. So, Professor Gilna Abuka, thank you very much for this interview, for your time, and for this interesting insights in your project, in the online journals and in I hope all the best for their future work in reception uh, theory and the collaborations with the interested researchers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this. Thank you. <laughs>